Let's talk about autonomous ships and the future of the maritime industry. The question that we get asked most at Future Nautics is what's going to change in the future. And we always turn that on its head and say, no, the question you should be asking yourself is what isn't going to change <coughs> in the future. And the reason that I say what's not going to change in the future is that we have a group of global megatrends and they are colliding with exponentially moving technologies. So the megatrends are the uh, transition from the, E7 to, from the G7 to the E7 economies. We're seeing rapid urbanization as people start to move in uh, to the cities. And there is a recognition that virgin resources are finite and that we need to, to manage those resources uh, appropriately. And of course, as a population, we're aging. And as a population ages, it consumes more services and less physical goods. <coughs> so we need to transition our economies from goods-based economies to service-based economies. And those global megatrends are meeting breakthrough technologies, exponentially moving technologies, many of which you will have already seen uh, in, in maritime. Connectivity, big data analytics, 3D printing, robotics, and of course, what we're talking about today, uh, autonomy. And probably just recently, you've seen quite a lot in, um, in blockchain uh, as well. But we need to overlay on top of those megatrends, those breakthrough technologies, we need to overlay millennial, Gen Y, <coughs> and Gen Z attitudes. And they, as a generation, have very different attitudes to someone of my generation, for example. They prefer access over ownership. They want to have access to a car without owning it. They want to have access to music without having physical um, CDs um, and vinyl, if you go back that far. Uh, they actually value transparency. They want to know that the goods that they're buying today have been ethically sourced and come from a sustainable uh, source as well. And they prefer collaboration to the, that sort of adversarial way in which we've done business in the past. And of course, very hot on uh, sustainability. But really, to truly understand what's coming our way, we need to make, uh, we need to understand the difference between linear and exponential. This guy here is the guy seated is Gordon Moore, the eponymous Moore's Law. Computing power doubles approximately every 18 months, and the uh, price of that technology halves. And that's led to massive reduction in the price of technology that we've seen, that we see today. So here's some uh, great examples, 3D printing. So what would have cost you $40,000 in 2007? By 2014, the equivalent technology cost 100 bucks. That's a 400 times reduction in the price in just seven years. And that's just not, that's not 3D printing, that's every technology. And sensors, for example, the, start, the stuff that we're starting to see in autonomous vehicles, uh, 250. Uh, times reduction in price over five years. <coughs> and what uh, futurists like um, <coughs> Ray Kurzweil noticed with his law of accelerating <coughs> returns is it's not just about the technology. If an industry becomes technology enabled, if it implements that exponentially moving technology, then <coughs> its performance begins to double approximately annually and once that starts, it really doesn't stop. And that's where we get the D word, disruption. You hear a lot about disruption in the maritime industry at the moment. It's the big buzzword. Every, every product, every service that comes in is disruptive. But actually, truly disruptive technology is quite difficult to spot. It bumbles along the bottom of that growth curve before shooting up exponentially. One good uh, example of that is, is mobile phones, of course. And actually, <coughs> where that linear growth um, deviates from exponential growth is where we see that level of disruption. And people have got it badly wrong in the past. Iridium is a good example in our industry. Um, McKinsey, for example, forecast that there would only ever be a, a million mobile phones in the world. And uh, AT&T on that never went into the, what was one of the most lucrative um, business sectors uh, in the world. <coughs> but this gets more complicated because those technologies combine and we get this combinatorial effect. 
So you've got the granddaddies of, um, of exponential growth, the internet, <coughs> social, mobile, analytics, and cloud, and they're starting to combine with 3D printing, uh, IoT, robotics, etc. and they create these new disruptive scenarios, the connected car, uh, smart cities, and of course, as we're talking about today, autonomous vehicles. And that's why we think at Future Nautics that the world is likely to change more in the next 30 to 50 years than it has done in the centuries between the beginning of the Renaissance and the 20th century. We call it the Enaissance, the birth of the exponential age. And our lives and expectations in that 30 to 50 years are going to change radically. And of course, the business environment is going to change radically <coughs> too. So I think it's worth just taking a pause at the moment and looking at shipping, where we are in the shipping industry. Now, shipping industry is opaque, it's inefficient, uh, it's starting to destroy value in its companies, and it's failing to satisfy its customers. We're speculating on tonnage. We're making our money through buying and selling ships rather than focusing on the uh, customer proposition. And that's probably understandable because cargo owners, charterers, they want the lowest price. And that's actually not what we're hearing in the industry. We're starting to hear more and more cargo owners talking to us and charterers saying, actually, we're prepared to pay more if we can track where those vessels are, if we know where, where our cargoes are at any one time, and we can ensure that our cargoes don't get rolled, for example. Now, in defense for ship owners, digital infrastructure investment is very hard <coughs> when all finance is asset-based and it's around the steel. Um, <coughs> and we needed equity investment, we needed PE to come in, that did come in, it listened to the incumbents, it got its fingers burnt and, and most of it's left. But I think the most important thing on this slide is that everyone is reassuring itself, themselves, that there's an upturn coming. That shipping has always been cyclical and it'll always be cyclical. And actually, the evidence doesn't support that. We're now seeing that link between global GDP and seaborne trade volumes starting to decouple. When I started in the industry, 1% growth in global GDP, 2 to 3% increase in seaborne trade. That's now less than 1%. So 1% in GDP, under 1% in, in global seaborne trade. And the reason for that is we're at the end of the democratic, democratic sweet spot. As I said, as a population, we're getting older. <coughs> we cons we're going to consume less goods. We're going to consume more services. So healthcare, insurance, um, travel, those kinds of services. And why does that matter to us? Well, it matters because we're going to ship less. We'll be less goods to consu being consumed and we'll ship less around the world. And if you take our millennials, their income is at least 20% below the national average. They have, the next generation that's coming along has less spending power than we do. Therefore, there'll be less consumption. And that gets um, <coughs> compounded by the fact that they value access over ownership as well. So the conditions for continued consumer growth really aren't there, and it doesn't look likely it will have another China to save us. So that's why we're seeing many economists now uh, coming to the same conclusion that actually by 2030, seaborne trade volumes won't be significantly higher than they are today. Maybe 1% Danish ship finance, say, is their best case um, scenario. So then. Are we all passengers just rearranging deck chairs um, on the deck of the Titanic? Well, no, actually, I don't think we are. I think exponentially moving technologies are creating the greatest opportunity for shipping since the advent of steam. And why do I say that? Well, if we look at the global businesses, they are in the process of integrating their operations into a seamless digital whole, and they're going to change the world process, and that's all based around in something called Industry 4.0, which is the embedding of digital, exponentially moving technologies, as we've seen, into an interoperable global value chain. They are merging the physical and the digital. And we're seeing that also uh, in the logistics industry, coming up with something called the physical internet, 
So if you think about packet data, they're applying packet data principles to moving physical assets around. So you might have something called <coughs> a, a pie container, which may be, which is not a container full of pies, I'll point out. <coughs> uh, but a pie container could be a 40-foot TEU, it could be a cardboard box. But in those, or attached to those, or a part of those, is something called a cryptographic anchor, which is a way in which we can track goods. Not just when it's in transport, but through the lifetime of the goods. <coughs> so that says the logistics industry say, well, we can break those um, pie containers up. We can combine them. We can move them in different directions as long as they actually get, like a piece of packet data, as long as it gets to the destination at the right time, and we can combine it at that point. <coughs> and we are the heart of that disruption. We sit at the heart of many, if not all, of the global value chains, global supply chains around the world. And they will be the intellig intelligent transport system. And we are the, the veins, the arteries of that uh, industry 4.0. And it's hyper-connected all the way from the producer right through to the consumer giving us that level of transparency and generating trust. And autonomous systems sit at the heart of that. They are the physical manifestation, if you like, of that, and they're going to be one of the most disruptive meta-trends uh, of the future. And we're seeing them everywhere at the moment. So cars, for example, you will have seen that. They're going to start transforming uh, <coughs> urban mobility. So, do we need, do I need a garage for my car? We're not going to own cars in the way that we own them today. Do I need a car? Well, my autonomous vehicle will turn up and take me wherever I want to go. And it'll be connected to my phone, my calendar, and the train timetables, and my flight, etc., etc. So do we need garages? Do we need drives? Do we need parking? Do we need petrol stations? Does this mean that actually the high street is going to regenerate itself? We see lots of orthogonal effects that come out of autonomous systems. Trucks, for example, big work going on, autonomous trucks, certainly in the US, and actually some key, some really quite interesting similarities between the trucking industry and the short sea um, sector. For example, the American Trucking Association, the industry body there, say that they, if they could make just 1% of trucks in the US autonomous, it would save the shipping industry two and a half billion dollars a year. And of course we're seeing it in aircraft as well, not only drones flying all over the globe uh, in military guises, but also Boeing. The last six months we've been testing autonomous and unmanned passenger aircraft. Big demand uh, for air passengers. Uh, and big growth in air passengers, um, and going to be a shortage of pilots. Does that ring a bell, anybody? Uh, and they're looking at ways of reducing the numbers in the cockpit, uh, and in some instances taking them out. Next time you're at Heathrow, and you're on a British Airways flight, have a look out of the window at a little tug that pushes you back <coughs> from the gate. That's a remote control autonomous um, tug. And that's transforming operations, but that's not just at airports, of course. It's in factories, it's in um, warehouses all over the world. So to think we as an industry are not going to see the effects of autonomous systems is ridiculous. It'll affect us like it's affecting other, every other industry. And we've already seen that, of course, with Rolls-Royce, who have been pioneering this pretty much since we started with, uh, with Future Nautics. They're partnered with Google to work on their uh, artificial intelligence, uh, machine learning algorithms. There's the Maximus project that's just come out on um, collision avoidance and, and coal regs. Uh, and of course, they've remotely tested a tug in the, uh, in the port of Copenhagen uh, last year. And then Kongsberg and uh, the Yarra Birkeland is what's in the news at the moment. The first unmanned autonomous uh, container ship unload itself, dock itself. Um, and that's going to take 40,000 trucks off the roads of Norway. 
And I think the most significant thing about that is that whole project was instigated not by somebody in shipping, but from a fertilizer company. These are people coming in and looking at shipping as an opportunity to be <coughs> uh, an economic and also uh, an environmentally friendly way of moving goods around the globe. NYK, I was in Japan last week, NYK talking about a remote controlled container ship sailing across the uh, Pacific next year. And they're working on the system, putting the systems in place uh, for that. Bartzilla, of course, and uh, they were remote controlling a PSV off the coast of Scotland from uh, their control center in San Diego, which is 5,000 miles away. <coughs> just recently, of course. Masterly, the, the, the combination of Willemsen, Kongsberg, which is in the news, which you probably picked up on, that's going to be the first autonomous unmanned shipping company. So I have to say, where are we? In the UK, where are we? We're not two miles from Silicon Roundabout. We have in Marsat, uh, in, in the city of London, we have Rolls-Royce in the city of London. But the UK itself is not in one of these projects. We need to be. And the short sea sector is where it's going to start first. And you're, you have a massive opportunity at this moment in time to get in and start working on some of these projects. Um, because actually, today, this is the last generation of ships as we know them that are being produced now. No ship that we have today will be fully autonomous and unmanned. We can't. We can't put those out to sea because we can't maintain them. Every ship that we build at the moment is still a prototype. And that gives us a time frame. It helps me frame <coughs> when we're going to move to fully autonomous and the majority of the market. And I we don't think we're going to see the, the majority of that market in autonomous shipping, certainly deep sea, until we're into 2040, somewhere of that time frame. So that's really given a lifespan of 20 years the ships today, sometimes shorter. 2040, why it's the majority of the market, but we'll see it in short sea shipping first. And that will be uh, happening uh, quicker than you think. And that, as I said, presents us with a massive opportunity. Because if I look at the ships today, these guys, we ain't doing a very good job at designing ships. It took us years to get these things into port get the ports capable of taking them. We can only get them in at high tide. There's all kinds of surcharges with moving them in at that, uh, at that time. And actually, although these ships have done wonders to reduce the carrier's emissions and the unit costs, what it's done is push those carbon emissions back onto its customers. <coughs> because they're taking them into hub ports and then those um, containers need to find their way point of consumption. And if we look in other industries, what they're doing is moving the point of manufacturing, for example, to the point of consumption. These aren't. And if we take slow steaming, for example, that a lot of these vessels are involved in, if you add three days to the global supply chain, the shippers need to hold an extra $5.7 billion worth of inventory. That's $5.7 billion worth of goods that we produced that are sitting there just to put up with slow steaming. And that can't be a good situation. So what do we need to do? We need to standardize the vessels and we need to simplify them. We need to redefine what we mean by a ship. I use this example. This is a from Tony Sieber's book. Um, <coughs> on clean disruption. And I normally talk about I'll talk on this slide about um, the impact that electric vehicles are going to have on the number of um, <coughs> parts that we move around the world. An internal combustion engine, 2,000 moving parts. An electric vehicle, 18 moving parts. So electric vehicles are 10 to 100 times cheaper to maintain. And that's getting us to a situation where Tesla is saying, we can offer now to our customers an infinite mile warranty. So what the point that I'm making here is if we start to standardize, we start to simplify the vessels that we build, and it doesn't need just to be electric, there are other options um, out there, then we can 
get around this whole issue of having to perform maintenance at sea. And once we can get around that issue, we can do maintenance in ports. We can adopt that airline model where we take, routinely take ships out of service to perform maintenance on them. What Rolls-Royce are talking about this, they're talking about modular systems that you hook on for power and so on and so forth. And as I said, it doesn't need to be electric. There are millions, tens, hundreds of millions of dollars going into compact nuclear fusion right now. That's one of our black swans of future nautics. That will radically change everything, not just autonomous ships, but that could have quite easily be used. So there are alternatives if we want to think about uh, deep sea. So <coughs> actually, standardization and simplification also brings a lot of benefits, not just to the customer, uh, but it uh, and allows us to uh, make those autonomous vessels uh, maintenance-free at sea, but it delivers a lot for the operator too. 40, 50% uh, saving in operational costs from moving the crew. Artificial intelligence is giving us uh, increased safety. We can reduce emissions and we can increase the cargo carrying capacity of the vessel. We can turn that ecosystem, which we use to keep 20 people alive in a very harsh environment, we can turn that into a revenue generating space for the, for the ship operator. Standardization also does a lot for building costs of the vessel too. We can simplify it, we can make those um, build costs uh, a lot less. So, when, I, when we sit there at Future Nautics and think about future scenarios, what I see is actually we're going to move to a situation where we have a larger number of smaller vessels. Think of it in the packet data sense again. It's a great analogy with pie containers and with the physical internet. And actually, longer term, it'll, we'll see the boundaries between deep sea shipping and short sea shipping blur. So I can see a, a time <coughs> when we don't have a distinction between deep and short sea shipping. We will have a lot more vessels chugging in that sort of packet data sense. So what are the hurdles that we need to overcome before we can get to that situation? Well, technology is not one of them, actually. All this technology is available today. Connectivity, the likes of Inmarsat and Intelsat, they're spending or have spent tens of billions of dollars in new satellite infrastructure. AI, machine learning, edge computing, blockchain, it's all available, it's all there. Much of it's been tested, and actually what we're doing there is just a pattern matching exercise. And actually it's not a high stakes pattern matching exercise like it is with autonomous cars. It's a lot less. So, regulation, yeah sure, we've got issues around regulation, but in 2017 we start to see the emergence of platforms in maritime. So Alibaba, Maersk, we've seen BHP Billiton um, trying to disintermediate brokers. We've seen DNVGL with their Veracity platform, Cognify, and just recently, the last couple of weeks, we've seen uh, Conceris and uh, Eniram, which is a fart seller company, looking at usage-based insurance. So taking data, assessing risk <coughs> on that. So we're seeing platforms emerge, and what you see around platforms is ecosystems, and ecosystems form, and they all form around sharing data. So with those platforms, we pull back data, we can pull it back in virtual real time, we can pull back all sorts of uh, different data from sensors. Actually, ships are equipped very well with sensors, it's just we've not connected them up yet. Um, and what does that mean? That means that actually, we can make truly evidence-based decisions. We can make evidence-based policy and we could actually monitor and regulate ships in real time. Ships could earn the, the, the right to operate almost by, from a minute-by-minute minute basis. And we're gonna need that because technology is moving so fast <coughs> uh, and that's, move, as I said, moving exponentially but bureaucracy moves uh, in a linear fashion. And there we get what's called the bureaucratic singularity, which means that, that technology is outpacing our ability to regulate it. And actually for IMO, that was around the cybersecurity um, issue. 
But that bureaucratic singularity means that actually those ecosystems which form around the, the platforms will proactively and collaboratively start to regulate themselves. So I'll just use this as an example. It's quite a fun example. Um, 2015, 2016, uh, a Secret Service agent showing off to his mate lands a drone on the White House lawn. And there's absolute outrage. Um, how can we have you know, the best Army and Navy Air Force? We can have Bruce Willis in a dirty vest, and we can't stop this thing actually touching down on the White House lawn. So the regulator said, yeah, we've got to regulate. We've got to stop this. Um, but what actually happened is DGI, the manufacturer of the drone, bought out a software patch for it. It had lots of cool gadgets in it, some stuff to do with the camera and all sorts of things that you'd want to uh, add to your drone. It was free. It also contained geofencing, and it geofenced 10,000 sites in the US. Uh, and within a matter of 10 days, 80, 90% of the users of that drone had downloaded the patch and 80 to 90% of those uh, drones were geofenced and to stop them going into airports and sensitive sites around the US. So that's a, an example, it's quite a fun one, just how we can see that. <coughs> Ecosystem start to collaboratively regulate itself. And I think what the, you've probably seen the findings of the, the Maximus project, Rolls-Royce and Atlas and Warsash, I think involved in that. Um, I think it starts, uh, basically what that said was that with the, um, the uh, our existing, with AI, it can work within the framework of the collision regs, even if those, uh, even if the vessels are doing things that they shouldn't be doing under the, uh, under the coal regs. So I think we need to also to question which regulations we really need to change to adapt uh, to this new technology. So we come on to safety. Um, that's another hurdle. Yes, they need to be as safe uh, as the vessels that we see out there um, today. But actually, crew fatality rates out in the industry today are 10 times OECD best practice. So yeah, you bet you they've got to be uh, as safe as what we're doing at the moment. <coughs> and a lot of what we will have is AI. And uh, one thing I'll just say about AI is AI doesn't have an ego. Take Siri. Try and have an argument with Siri or Alexa when you get home tonight. It doesn't have an ego. It doesn't have bravado. So think in terms of road rage. Think in terms of this person will give way to me because it's my right of way. AI is cautious. It has perfect knowledge. It knows <coughs> what's going on around it, and it's cal calculating infinite what-if situations. So it is more cautious than much of what, many of the people we see uh, on the roads um, and, and some of which we see at sea today. This is Jess. And you may have seen that it's a channel from a Channel 4 program. If you haven't seen it, I suggest you go and watch it. It's fascinating. She is a, an AI counselor. So you can take your uh, marital or your family problems to, to Jess. And she has knowledge of your bank account, of your shopping, of your social media, of your website history, uh, and many other things about you. And she has a very logical way of solving your problems. Now, the thing to take away from that, other than it's, it's fascinating programs worth watching, is how quickly we as humans start to trust AI. <coughs> Everybody uh, who, who went through and, and talked to this robot ended up loving it, wanting to take it home. It solved many of their problems, and it did that because it has perfect knowledge, and it has no ego, it doesn't take sides, and it understands uh, about things uh, that, that, that we, uh, and the patterns that it, 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 it matches between your um, <coughs> data that perhaps we wouldn't uh, otherwise have, have, have made. As I say, it's worth a watch. And then we have cybersecurity, because autonomous vessels will be more vulnerable, won't they, because they're just uh, cyber systems, essentially. Actually, I'd question that because 60% of all cyber breaches, according to the 2016 IBM uh, Cyber Intelligence Index, were caused by human beings. Now, some of that is malicious, some of that is just totally unintentional. Uh, 
But if you take those humans out of, this, out of the loop, you shut the system down, you take away immediately 60% of the threat. And actually, hackers target people. They don't tend to target infrastructure. They target people. The World Economic Forum, and I agree, says that, that cyber security, if we don't get a good handle on it, will act as a break on technology adoption and uh, digital investment, and it could cost the world up to $3 trillion. We did a survey just recently, 6,000 uh, <coughs> seafarers across all sectors, 47% of them told us that on their last contract they'd sailed on a vessel that had been the subject of a cyber attack. Now I said that humans are your, are your greatest vulnerability, they're also your, at the moment, your greatest barrier to stop attacks, uh, cyber attacks. But 85% of the crew that we spoke to had never been given any cyber security training whatsoever. Half of them didn't know whether there was a cyber safe policy in place or said there wasn't a cyber safe policy in the shipping company in which they were sailing with. That's about putting USB sticks into EGDIS, EGDISes or plugging in your, uh, your, your personal drive into the ship's network and causing um, damage that way. And of course, you probably saw um, the social media around hackers grabbing hold of satellite antennas. They sit out on the, on, on the internet, they have an IP address. And we found that only 18% of ship operators actually changed their default password of the equipment any equipment they have on board. So it's probably hardly surprising that hackers with nothing to do will go out and seek and find these things on the internet and start playing with them. 25% had no company password policy at all. <coughs> Two final hills that we need to get over. First one is mindset, and the second one is mindset. And I know technically that's only one hurdle, but it's such a big one, I thought it was probably worth mentioning twice. Same survey, we asked crew, had any of their job been automated in the last two years? 53% said yes, it had. When we looked at the officer group involved in that survey, it was 72%. But 98% of them said that it had a positive effect on their role and life at sea. So we then talked to them <coughs> about technology all the technologies that I've talked about, uh, exponentially growing technologies, were these a threat to their jobs or were these an opportunity for them? And this is the group that I pulled out. Uh, this is specifically short sea uh, shipping respondents. So this is everything from uh, offshore to, um, <coughs> to uh, row packs um, and, and, and work boats. So green bars are where they saw opportunity, red bars are where they saw technology as a threat. So we have automation, robotics, big data, unmanned ships, artificial intelligence, drones, et cetera, et cetera, going across the bottom there. So as we've seen from the last slide, probably unsurprisingly, sea automation is a big <coughs> opportunity, 69, 70%, uh, as do they see data analytics as, as an opportunity and predictive maintenance and augmented virtual reality. In fact, they saw all the technologies as more of an opportunity than a risk, apart from unmanned ships, which is quite understandable. But actually, 35% of those crew said that unmanned ships were an opportunity. Only 50% said they were a threat. So I don't think we were quite, <coughs> quite prepared to see such um, a small gap between the two there. And I think what that says to me is this group is not the conservative group that you think they are. These guys are highly techni technologically literate. Uh, they embrace new technology and they're willing to change. So maybe it's us sitting ashore that are the conservative ones here. So just in summary, autonomous ships are a massive opportunity. The Enesons, as I said, are gonna change our lives and the way in which we do business. Exponential technologies are going to allow us to reimagine the maritime industry. And autonomous ships are that physical manifestation of what I was talking about in terms of intelligent mobility. And being part of that blue logistics channel, 
will allow shipping to become transparent uh, and it'll be trusted by its customers and their customers and eventually trusted by the consumer as well, which is where we need to go. As we say at Future Nautics, the future isn't somewhere we go, it's something we create. And if you can think about that future, you can be that future and that future starts now. So I'll leave it there. Thank you very much. Thank <laughs> you.